Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's case was actually requested by one of Paige's friends, so I really, really hope this video does her case justice and that we can help bring some justice to her and her family. I wanted to cover this case because honestly, it just has not been spoken about enough. It's one of those very frustrating cases where we pretty much know who's responsible, but that person refuses to speak or give any information, so we really have no idea what actually happened. But before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my patrons, Amanda, Gaja, Jessica, Rebecca, and Abrar. Thank you all so much for your support, especially with how crazy busy and stressful this past month has been for me. Your support means even more to me, so I cannot thank you enough. I appreciate each and every one of you more than you can ever imagine, so from the bottom of my heart, Thank you so much. So with that being said, let's get into the video. Today, we're going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance and death of Paige Johnson. Paige Johnson was born on September 22nd, 1993 to her parents, Donna and Gary Johnson, and has an older sister named Brittany and a younger brother named Garrett. Now, both her parents were involved in their lives, but her mom worked endless hours because she worked in the bar scene, so she just wasn't home a lot. Her father was described as a great guy, but he he fell into drugs. He tried his best to stay in his children's lives, but this is what he fell into, so it made things really difficult. So Paige and her siblings lived with their grandparents in Edgewood, Kentucky. Paige was described as very outgoing and outspoken, loving to be the center of attention and the life of the party. She was always down for adventure and was always ready to try something new. She was small but mighty, and if you made her angry, she was like a firecracker. But at the same time, she was very kind and trusting, and maybe even even naive. She just wanted to see the best in everybody, and that seemed to be what could have gotten her into trouble. Paige was also described as being very athletic. She was a cheerleader and a gymnast, and she was very, very good at her sports. Growing up, she was always jumping and flipping around, so her mom signed her up for gymnastics classes, and her skills blossomed from there. Now, even though they had a three-year age gap, Paige and her sister Brittany were incredibly close growing up. She spent as much time as she could with her sister. Even though they had separate rooms, Paige always wanted to be in her big sister's room. They did everything together and were basically inseparable. Now, Paige and Brittany were pretty wild teenagers. They liked to go out and party and drink and everything like that. So by the time Paige was 16 years old, she actually found herself pregnant, which was crazy because her sister Brittany was actually pregnant at the same time. So they went through both of their pregnancies together. Paige ended up having a beautiful baby girl who she named Mackenzie. And after having a baby, Paige did drop out of high school to focus on her role as a mother. Now, September 22nd, 2010 was Paige's 17th birthday, so she wanted to go out and have some fun for her birthday. She had asked Brittany if she wanted to go out with her, and Brittany was dealing with her own stuff with her boyfriend at the time, so she told Paige no, that she couldn't go out, but said that Paige could stop over at her house later that night, which was in Covington. So she ended up hanging out with one of her her older friends, 22-year-old Jacob Bumpus. Jacob was a friend that she knew through her sister, so he was friends with the both of them. So the plan for them for the night was to possibly go out to a party and then for both of them to go to Covington to meet up with Brittany and a few of their mutual friends at her house. So I believe that she was at her mother's house that night, so Jacob went over to Paige's mom's house to pick her up. Once he got there, Paige left, letting her mom know that she was going out with a friend for the night. Now, at the time, Paige had one of those Go phones where you had to buy minutes each month, and by this time, her phone had run out of minutes, so she just left her phone at home. So, she told Brittany and this other mutual friend that she would be calling them later that night from a different phone number before heading over to their house to just sort of let them know the plans. But that phone call never came. Now, when time came to go to Brittany's and hang out with them for the night, she never showed. But at first, Brittany and her mutual friend thought nothing of it. They thought that Paige probably just got carried away partying at a friend's house and that she would be back the next morning. However, that next morning when Paige still wasn't home, Brittany immediately grew concerned. She called her mother Donna to ask her if she had seen Paige and she hadn't. Now, at the time, Donna had actually been driving towards Indiana, which is a about a two and a half hour drive from where they lived to drop her boyfriend at the time off at a job interview. But after learning that Brittany had not seen Paige that entire night and that next morning, 
Donna immediately knew that this was not normal for Paige, so she turned around and went home. Once Donna got home, her and Brittany filed a police report with the Covington Police Department. But of course, at first, police assumed that since this was a 17-year-old girl, that she was probably just out partying and that she would be home in a couple of days, either that or maybe she had run away. But her family knew that she would never run away, especially since she had a little daughter who she loved so much. So even though police were not taking her disappearance seriously at first, her family immediately went out and started searching for her. The very next day, her family started searching around everywhere that they could, printing out flyers and posting them everywhere they could. They reached out to everybody that they could think of to see if anybody knew where she was and nobody had seen her. So they knew that something happened had to be horribly wrong. Of course, they knew that the last person that Paige was seen with was 22-year-old Jacob Bumpus. They went over to him to talk to him about what may have happened that night, and he admitted that she did come over. Now, at first, he said that he didn't give her any beer, that she didn't drink at all, but eventually, he did admit that he had given her a couple of beers. He said that that night, after they had hung out and drank for a while, he dropped her off at 15th Street and Scott Boulevard in Covington around 1 a.m which is right by where Brittany's house was. Jacob said that at that point, she was pretty drunk and that she walked off and that he didn't see her again after that. That is all he would say about that entire night. Now, the first weird thing about this story is that this area definitely is not known for being the nicest area. There's a lot of crime activity and it's not a safe place to be dropping off a 17-year-old tiny little petite girl to go and walk off by herself. Her family couldn't figure out why if he was such a good friend of Paige's that he would just let her walk off by herself knowing that she was completely drunk, knowing what kind of area this was. His behaviors after this were also very strange. He didn't help with any of the searches for Paige and he was not forthcoming with information at all. He hired a lawyer immediately and refused to give any further information whatsoever. Now, like I've said in so many of my previous videos and just like so many other true crime YouTubers say, hiring a lawyer when you're involved in a missing persons investigation isn't always 100% suspicious right away. I believe that you should 100% always hire a lawyer whether you're guilty or not if you're involved in any sort of missing persons or murder investigation or anything else like that. But the fact that he lawyered up right away and the fact that he would not give any other information when he's known to be the last person with her and that he wouldn't even help search for her all of that is very concerning and very suspicious. Now, after Paige was missing for about a day, Brittany realized that Paige had actually sent her a message on Facebook Messenger at around 12, 12 a.m. on September 23rd. Now, Facebook messaging back in 2010 definitely was not what it's like today, so she didn't even realize that she had a message until she specifically went on Facebook to check. So, that night, Paige had actually sent her a message saying, girl, call me now, I need to talk to you immediately with immediately being in all caps. Now, it's not known whether this message was sent before Jacob picked her up or after. It's not known exactly the situation surrounding when she sent this, but since Paige told Brittany that she would be calling her from a different number that night, presumably Jacob's number, it's thought that maybe she sent this off of Jacob's phone after he picked her up. But either way, we really don't know exactly what this message is even about. So after Paige had been missing for a few days, police started to realize that maybe this wasn't just her going out and partying and doing her own thing. So police came to the public to ask for tips regarding any information about her whereabouts. Tips came in which led them to searching an area around a nearby farm in Bourbonville, which is a city around two and a half hours away from Covington. Authorities sifted through acres and acres of bush and overgrowth. They dug in the ground and actually ended up digging about six to eight feet deep in an area about the size of an Olympic swimming pool, but absolutely nothing came of this search. So obviously, police also went and started looking into Jacob Bumpus. They interviewed him, and of course, he told them the same story about what had happened that night. He had also mentioned that that same night, he went fishing, but that's really all he said. Then, after this first interview, he would not give police any more information. He would not cooperate with police at all ever again throughout the entire course of this investigation. So, police went ahead 
ahead and searched into Jacob's cell phone data. They had found out that him and Paige had been communicating regularly in the days leading up to the 23rd, but after that day, there was no more communication. I don't think he sent absolutely any more messages after that night. Nothing to ask her if she got to her sister's okay, nothing the day after it came out that she was missing to see if maybe he could get a hold of her or see if she was okay nothing. They also started looking into his cell phone pings to see if they matched up with the story that he was telling about that night, and of course, they didn't. So, he said that he was in Covington dropping Paige off at around 1 a.m. that night. However, it turns out that around 1 a.m., his phone actually pinged in Florence, which is around 10 miles away from Covington and by where Paige's mom lived. So, it's clear that he lied about the timeline and where he had dropped off Paige. Brittany believes that when they had originally gotten together to hang out. Paige had asked him to bring her to those crossroads that he had reported so that she could walk over to Brittany's house that night. So she thinks that because Paige told him this, that this is how Jacob knew that this is where her house was and where she was expected to be dropped off. And so that's why he thought to lie about dropping her off at these specific crossroads. Then between the times of 4.13 and 4.30 a.m., his phone pinged at East Fork Lake, all the way in Ohio. Then I believe when he was still in Ohio, he started posting some weird things to his Facebook. He posted something that said like a fish without any context. So we don't really know what that even means. The other thing he posted was there must be something to cure this insomnia. But then after that, he didn't post anything else to his Facebook that night. So East Fork Lake is one of Ohio's largest state parks spanning about 4,870 acres. The terrain includes rugged hills, winding rivers, a large lake, and open meadows. So investigators went there and started searching the 2,160-acre lake, which is over 100 feet deep in some parts. They had over 100 searchers on ATV and out on horseback searching the area and used cadaver dogs, but nothing was found. Now, after finding out more about that night, turns out that Jacob Bumpus wasn't the only person that Paige was hanging out with the night she disappeared. So the person that she had been hanging out with that night has not been named publicly, nor has he been named by police as a person of interest, but according to the family, this dude is far from a stand-up guy. First, he was known for using drugs such as heroin. It also came out, I think, about a year after Paige's disappearance that he was convicted of raping another young girl. But before he was actually convicted of the rape, he was already sort of known around town as being sort of this skeevy guy who would give underage girl drugs and then just just to take advantage of them. So at the time that Paige went missing, he was only sort of speculated and rumored to take advantage of young girls, but about a year after her disappearance, he was convicted of being a rapist. So definitely not the best guy that she was hanging out with, and we will get more into him in just a few minutes. So police continued searching for Paige and following up on whatever leads they could. About a year after Paige's disappearance, Jacob did end up in jail, but it wasn't for the reason that we were hoping for. It was just for a parole violation for something that he had previously been charged with, but I'm not exactly sure what he was even on parole for. So he went to jail, but he was released only a few months later. Also, about a year after Paige's disappearance, her mother decided to declare her as legally dead. This, of course, was a very difficult decision, but there was some good reasoning behind it. They did this hoping that they could get more answers out of Jacob. They went ahead and filed a civil lawsuit against Jacob for wrongful death. So obviously, before they could do that, they had to declare her as dead or else there'd be no reason to file a wrongful death suit. However, the entire time, he just pled the fifth and would not put forth any information. They also tried to get him to take a polygraph test and he refused. So over the course of 10 years, police continued their searches, they continued receiving tips, and her case remained open and active. Jacob Bumpus, for some reason, was not named as a suspect by police, and he continued his streak of not saying a single word throughout the entire investigation. However, almost 10 years after her disappearance, the family finally got some of the answers that they had desperately been waiting for 
for so many years. 911 received a call from a woman who reported that she had found a human skull while she was out deer hunting with her husband. This skull was found near Ohio 276 in Williamsburg Township in Claremont County, Ohio, near East Fork State Park. So police set out to search this wooded area around where the skull had been reportedly found and they did end up finding a human skull in the area off Mathis Road. Where the skull was found was only two miles away from where they had originally searched for Paige and less than a mile away from where we know Jacob's phone had last pinged. And using dental records, police were able to confirm that the skull does officially belong to 17-year-old Paige Johnson. So at first, Jacob still was not charged with anything. Because of how little remains were found and how much they had already decomposed, there was no cause of death listed, and as far as I've seen, there still is no cause of death. However, by July 28th, 2020, Jacob stood in front of a grand jury on charges of abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence, and he was indicted on these charges. After his attorney argued that he was not a danger to anybody and that he was not a flight risk, his bail was set to $50,000, and it was paid in full by a bail bondsman for some reason under the condition that he have no contact with Paige's family. So, those are the only charges that he is facing as of right now. So, there have been no homicide charges made in this case, and prosecutors have said that it's unlikely that they'll ever be able to file homicide charges until they can determine a cause of death. They have said that they anticipate more charges being brought against Jacob, but for now, that is where this case stands. The entire time that Paige was missing, the family knew that both Jacob and his friend both had answers and knew exactly what happened to Paige. So the family is happy that there are finally being charges brought against Jacob, but they know that there's still such a long road ahead of them and that investigators still have so much more work that they need to do before they can officially bring justice to Paige and her family. So for now, there are a few theories as to what happened to Paige the night of her disappearance. Of course, all of these theories surround Jacob and possibly his friend, but what exactly happened is not known. So really, the theories more so surround whether Paige's death was intentional or accidental. Now, this first part isn't really confirmed, it's more so just a rumor, but I will just put it out there just so we know. So it's thought that Paige may have gone to a party with some of her other friends her own age that night. Some people have rumored that they saw this older guy to them, but probably was Jacob, and his friend carrying her out of the party after she had passed out. Again, this isn't confirmed, and it's only a rumor, so we really don't even know how true this is. But we do know that she did most likely go to Jacob's house that night, and whether it was after a party or if she went directly there, she got intoxicated that night, and they were drunk when they were together. So the first theory is that maybe Jacob and possibly his friend provided Paige with some sort of drugs, maybe hair heroin and that she accidentally died of an overdose and then to avoid getting in trouble, Jacob dumped her body so that nobody would find it. So first we know that Jacob admitted to at least giving her alcohol. Then we know that she was hanging out with this other dude who was known to use heroin. So the family thinks that maybe they convinced her to try heroin and because she was such a small and petite girl, she took too much and overdosed. So we also know that Jacob was on parole at the time. He initially lied and said that he didn't give Paige any alcohol but eventually gave in and ended up admitting that he did give this underage girl alcohol. And this broke his parole, so he knew that he could get in trouble for this. But he would have been in a lot more trouble if he admitted that he gave someone heroin that led to an overdose. So that would explain why he wouldn't want to report it and instead just dispose of her body and try to forget about the entire thing. We know that he would not say anything throughout the entirety of this investigation. And we know that he was acting very sketchy this entire time. So I think that no matter how she died, she died under Jacob's watch. But some questions that I do have is that if she did just accidentally die of a drug overdose, 
why didn't he bring her to the hospital and just drop her off there anonymously? He may not have even gotten into trouble if he just dropped her off at the hospital and gotten her the treatment that she needed. As far as I know, hospital workers and EMTs don't really report drug overdoses to police because obviously that would discourage anybody from getting help if they needed it. So I believe that if he dropped her off after having an overdose and was close to death but wasn't there, that he wouldn't have gotten in trouble because nobody would have reported it. Or Brittany had actually brought up a good point of maybe he did decide to drive her to the hospital and as they were on the way, she had died in his car. So it was at that point that he decided to just dispose of her instead of dropping her off. To me, it just doesn't make a ton of sense why he would put himself at so much risk of disposing her body rather than just anonymously dropping her off at the hospital. I would think that you would get in a lot more trouble for covering up an overdose than just getting them the help that they needed. Maybe he didn't know that police could track his phone and he just thought that the story of her walking off was believable and he didn't even want to take the chance of getting her help and he just wanted to erase this entire thing and pretend like it never happened. I don't really know, but that's kind of what I think would be going through his head at that point. So that leads me to my next theory. Within this theory, there are two lines of thought for me. Either Jacob and or his friend intentionally killed her or they did something to her that directly but unintentionally caused her death. So we know that Jacob and her were only friends and she actually had a boyfriend. She probably wanted no part in sleeping with him or his friend, but maybe either one or both of them tried making a move on her since of course she was alone with both of them at his apartment and then she turned them down so they got angry and killed her. I think that that makes sense and in terms of intentionally killing her, I can't really think of many other reasons why they would. Especially knowing that this other friend has a conviction of rape, that's really the only thing that I can think of of why they would want to kill her. Or maybe they had offered her heroin or just tried to convince her to take it and she was upset and didn't even realize that heroin was involved in all of this and then threatened to turn them into police and they got mad and killed her to cover that up. That could be another reason. But I don't know, I guess it could be possible but knowing her background and her history, I just don't think that that would have been the case. The other line of thinking was that they did something to her that caused her death. So again, we know that this other friend has a history of giving girls drugs and taking advantage of them. It could be possible that either Jacob or his friend or the both of them injected her with heroin to decrease her awareness or to even make her pass out so that they could take advantage of her but not trying to kill her intentionally. But then maybe they ended up giving her too much again because because she's tiny and petite and she died of an overdose that way. If both of them know that at least one of them are directly responsible for her death, that could be why they were so insistent on covering it up and burying her body rather than reporting it or taking her to the hospital. Getting rid of her body altogether and simply just not saying anything else about that night to absolutely anybody is a lot easier than reporting her overdose and trying to lie to police and say that she overdosed herself. And then, of course, obviously risking getting in trouble for having heroin there in the first place. Also, if they gave her too much heroin or any other drug against her will. That also explains why they wouldn't want to bring her to the hospital to get her treatment. If they had brought her to the hospital and she survived, then she may be able to remember what they did to her and then hold it against them and get them in trouble. Then I will just kind of throw this in there. It is possible that the friend is solely responsible for her death and that Jacob was just taking part in covering it up and hiding her body or something like that. I don't necessarily think it matters which one of them is 100% responsible, if it was one of them or both of them. Either way, Jacob knows exactly what happened and he will not tell anybody. So those are really the main theories in this case. Like I said, the theories aren't really around who is responsible. We pretty much know that. We know that Jacob and or his friend know exactly what happened and know exactly how. We know that all of the evidence points directly towards Jacob disposing of his body. His cell phone pings put him exactly in the place that her body would later be found the same night that she disappeared. It's obvious, but again, we don't know why. We don't know what happened, so at this point, we're just left to speculate. And to me, the more time that passes without Jacob saying absolutely anything, even after her body was found, 
even after it's confirmed that she did pass away, the longer that goes without Jacob saying anything, the more suspicious I am of him. It's 10 years later. If this was something that truly was an accident and Jacob, you know, maybe regrets dumping her or did this all in a panic without really trying to do anything bad to her, but is just trying to cover it up and save his own butt, I feel like by now he would have said something. If it truly was an accident and she truly just took a drug and died of a drug overdose, I think he might have talked by now. So with this, I do personally think that she did die of a drug overdose, whether she wanted to experiment with a new drug such as heroin and took too much and died, or whether they forced it on her, or whether they told her that it was something completely different and she had no idea what she was taking, or if it was something completely different of her dying of a completely different drug overdose, or of her drinking too much. I don't really know. But I do think that whether it was an accident or not, Jacob is a complete coward for never saying anything instead of just manning up and facing consequences for what happened. Again, I think the more time that passes without him admitting anything, the more I think that he is responsible for her death. I think he either convinced her to take it or he lied about what it was or him and his friend injected her with it or got her to smoke it or whatever with the intention of taking advantage of her. I do think that they took advantage of her. At this point, it's been so long. And again, neither of them had said anything. So I think it's obvious that they're trying to cover something up and they're trying to cover up something big. So whether they killed her on purpose or whether they gave her too much to take advantage of her, doesn't matter. I think that they did something to her. That's just my opinion. I honestly don't know if we're ever going to get answers from Jacob. He's gone 10 years without saying absolutely anything to anyone. He is well aware that she had a two-year-old little girl that had to grow up without a mother and he still refused to give any information. He clearly does not care about anybody but himself, and I honestly don't think he's ever going to come forward and tell anyone what really happened that night. I think it's really sad that they can't bring homicide charges against anybody simply because her body is too decomposed to figure out how she died. I just hate when that happens in cases because all that shows is that as long as you hide a body well enough and it's gone unfound for long enough, you won't get in trouble for murdering somebody. I do know that there's a lot of really great Great forensic scientists working on her case, trying to find her cause of death so that they can officially get real justice for her. I haven't seen anything posted about her case since last year, but I really think that there are people working on her case and working to figure out what happened to her. I am just crossing my fingers and really hoping that there's a way that they can determine a cause of death so that they can finally bring charges against someone. But for now, that is where the case stands. Again, I hope more comes out about what happened Happened, and I really hope police are still looking into her case and trying to find answers as to what happened. They have actually done a ton of searches over the years, so even though their knee-jerk reaction was that she may have just been a runaway or that she was out partying, that theory was quickly forgotten and they went into full force trying to look for her and trying to figure out what happened after her body was found. Obviously, I just wish that 10 years earlier they would have just looked two miles away from where they originally searched and found her because I think that if they found her sooner, there would have been a lot more evidence and they may have been able to bring charges. It's just crazy to me that she was found so close from where they had originally searched, but she wasn't found for 10 years. And I do think that that can say a lot for other cases. There's a lot of cases where we say, oh, they searched extensively. There's no way they can still be out there. But this case shows that even after searching for years and years and years, and no matter how extensive the searches are, the person can still be out there and just be waiting to be found. So that does give me a little bit of hope for other cases that are still unsolved and where people are still just searching for somebody's body. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think really happened that night? Do you think Jacob's responsible? Let's discuss in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, make sure to send those suggestions over to rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye! <laughs>